Hello and welcome to Continental Prime. My name is Felicity Ezeweke. The headlines at this hour. Germany officially recognizes colonial area Namibia genocide. United Nations criticizes conduct of Ethiopian military in Tigray. Africa's COVID-19 case load nears 4.8 million. We'll bring you details shortly. We begin the news at this hour in southern Africa. Historians say Germany, German general Lothar von Trotter, who was sent to Namibia for what was then known as the German South West Africa to put down an uprising by the Herero people in 1904, instructed his troops to wipe out the entire tribe. However, Germany has now agreed to pay the sum of 1.1 billion euros to the Namibian government as it has officially recognized the Hiroro Nama killing at the start of the 20th century as an act of genocide. A spokesman for the Namibian president, Haig Gengob, described Germany's acknowledgement of the genocide as the first step in the right direction, stating that it is the basis for the second step, which is an apology to be followed by reparations. Joining me to discuss this tonight is Shaman Ngajiu, a journalist at the Namibian newspaper. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you for having me, Felicity. So tell us about this um, new move. What is it about? Um, well, Namibia and Germany have been negotiating um, uh, on, on the genocide for the past five years. And the negotiations were very lengthy. Um, at some point, Namibia rejected different offers made by the German government in terms of um, the genocide. Um, like Germany at some point offered Namibia money or some form of money for the genocide, but Namibia rejected and so forth. But eventually, uh, the special envoy to um, for uh, yeah to the uh, the special envoy on the genocide or on Namibia's side went to Germany uh, three weeks ago, and the German we saw most of us most of us local journalists saw from uh, German uh, uh, newspaper outlets that there was a deal struck, but we never really got confirmation in terms of what exactly it entailed, uh, entailed until this week where we heard that um, Germany offered the Namibian government 1.1 billion euros. It, trans it translates to 18.6 billion Namibia dollars. Okay, uh, can, can yes. you just tell us, um, you've given us a bit of an idea what this is about, but could you explain if this brings some sort of closure for the people? What are the feelers you're getting? Uh, it doesn't bring any closure for the people because the affected communities have, the Ovaherero and the Nama uh, communities have rejected this deal because they feel government, when they went to negotiate, it wasn't in the best interest of the people, of the affected people. So they feel, uh, in as much as the government went, they were not really properly consulted or not even included in the negotiations, despite the uh, the special in where Z, uh, Dr. Z Gavira is saying, uh, the, the communities have been consulted in terms of uh, the negotiations. They feel it's a it's an insult. They feel the money offered by the German government is an insult. Yes, the German government now has finally um, acknowledged uh, that it is a genocide, in fact, and um, they are willing to pay uh, uh, this amount. But um, they it's not they, they don't even want to call it reparations. They want to call they want to call it uh, like a form of. Um, like it's for developmental basically yes but they not they don't want to say the money they're giving to namibia is reparations so the communities are rejecting it in fact this afternoon um they had they went on uh, they, they took to the streets to protest the whatever deal the government uh signed with uh the german uh the namibian government signed with the german governments and they are saying you know what we don't want this because it, it really does not reflect 
the atrocities caused to their people. Of and what import they... will these protests uh, be? Do you think that um, it will impact the decision in any way? Because just like you're noting, even activists are in on it and saying that this offer should be discarded. Yeah, I, I don't think that it will... Uh, I think it's the thought that counts, but I doubt it will be impactful. I, I really doubt it will make an impact because Namibia has already finalized the deal. They have not yet told us exactly what it entails apart from releasing bits and pieces of the deal. For instance, the 1.1 billion euros offered or Germany now is acknowledging and, and, and um, um, saying they will apologize to Namibia for the atrocities, but it will not be impactful. Um, Unless maybe like drastic steps are taken by But there must be some the good here, don't you think? Because it, we've known that it's it's not a common place for um, atrocities committed during the colonial era for the current generation to come and apologize for that. Is this not some you know some sort of um, um, appraisal, like an apology to the people? And wouldn't it be? changing the narrative in some way it, it does change the narrative in some, in some way but um like for instance the german government does not want to call the funding they're giving reparations for but they want to acknowledge that it was a genocide and they want to apologize so there's like some form of confusion as well do they really uh, if they don't want to call it a, a, a genocide uh, if they don't want to say whatever they're giving Namibia is reparations, then why do they have to admit that it was a genocide, for instance? So the communities just feel it, it's, it's, it's a bilateral agreement from the German government. And uh, uh, it's a bilateral agreement between the German government and the Namibian government. Um, I mean, it is a step forward. I, I'm, I'm part of the Ova Herero and the Nama community as well because I'm mixed. Um, and it is, it is a step, you know, the fact that they have admitted to uh, or acknowledge the fact that it was a genocide. You're, you're basically the, saying that the people are expecting much more, that, but this is at least some way, effort. Way more. I mean, you don't put value on human life, but if, if the money they are giving, it's for projects, but how will we implement these projects, for instance? You know, implementation is going to be a nightmare, for instance. And how will they ensure that all the affected, all the members from the affected communities benefit from these um, uh, funds that will be made available by the German government? So there's, there's, still, there's still a long a lot, way off. Still a long way. But I think the communities for now, they are still going to fight it because they do not, they do not feel this is it. They feel the Namibian government was tricked by the German government into accepting something that doesn't really benefit them and they feel the namibian government accepted this offer to advance the projects of the government under the harambe uh, the second harambe prosperity plan so government really needs to the namibian government really needs to okay. come out and pronounce pronounce itself on this you know All so right. it will be a for um the communities, uh, the communities accept this offer by the German government. But the yeah. apology, yes, it's, it, we've been waiting for this for so long. And we're, we're hoping to see more. <laughs> we're certainly hoping to see more. In the interest of time, Charmin, I must say thank you very much for joining us on the news. Thank you so much for having me. And be safe out there. All right. Bye-bye. Bye now. Staying in the region, around 200 sex workers have taken to the streets of Johannesburg, South Africa's capital, to demand that prostitution be decriminalized. According to aid organizations, an estimated 120,000 and 180,000 sex workers operate in South Africa. But the country's prostitution laws date back to the apartheid era, which punishes sex workers and their clients. Some of the protesters marched with their faces covered, flanked by police cars. Sex Workers Education and Advocacy Task Force say Prostitutes in South Africa are often victims of violence and rape. The task force says around 10 sex workers are murdered each year, but adds that many of such cases go unreported. Now, friends, we are demanding from the government that they must decriminalize sex work now, yes. not more 2024, oh, wow. not more 2025. Yes. As long as we have the first we have to we are
staying in the region. Zambia's former Minister of Community Development and Social Services, Emerian Kabanshi, has been sentenced to two years in prison. A magistrate court in the capital, Lusaka, found her guilty after her ministry misused $4.3 million meant for poor families. In 2018, President Edgar Lungu fired Kambashi and suspended 80 officials from the Ministry of General Education after an estimated $1.6 million of donor funds were allegedly embezzled. The scandals prompted the United Kingdom, Finland, Ireland and Sweden to suspend funding to the southern African country. Kambashi is facing two charges of willful failure to comply with the law. She is expected to appeal against the judgment. Let's move now to the east of the continent, where the Nigerian government has been taxed to invest more on young people as a means of securing the nation's future. This was as the Nigeria's Minister of Transportation visited the government's senior secondary school in the Zone 2 area of Wuse in the nation's capital to promote reading culture among the students. The event was also part of the Minister's Children's Day celebration, which is recognized by the Nigerian government. Our correspondent, Amadin Ui, reports. It was supposed to be a special day out with Nigeria's Minister of Transportation, Rotimi Amechi. However, for the students of the government's senior secondary school, Wuse, located in the Zone 2 district of Wuse in the nation's capital, Abuja, the visit by the minister turned out to be an extraordinary day. The minister, whose birthday also falls on the same day, took time out to promote reading culture among a select group of students. Set them by surprise. Don't worry, woman. Can our chakabulas and spears or matches and slings withstand the guns of the governor and his frontier soldiers? The book was chosen by the students, but had both parties read several chapters to hone their reading skills. Basically, it's to encourage young children to focus on education because it's the basis for which most of us grew. The minister, while appraising the students, says their reading competence level is worthy of commendation. I'm impressed with the children. I'm impressed. I'm impressed with the children. The way they spoke, the ones that read and all that. That's why I called the young girl who was on my left first, because she was very expressive. And there's an improvement as we go. There will be more improvement as government continues to encourage children to read. All we need is to harness our human resources. And that human resources lies with our young people. They are the hope of the future. They're the ones indeed that can fix this country. A lot of things are broken. We have cracked walls today in our country. But that's not to say that it should lose hope. With the right education, with the right mentorship, with the right character, they will play a very important or pivotal role in nation building. One other special guest in attendance, a former federal lawmaker, while commending the event, says gestures like this place a focus on young Nigerians, one he thinks is an investment in the future of Nigeria. This nation expects so much from them. Let them please put in their best, put their acts together and give us the country of our dream. We're almost losing it in our generation, but their generation will not lose them. Very optimistic and very incredible optimist that in this, our children, lies a great future for our country. The students also took time out to express how they feel. Well, I'm happy, I'm excited, and I was also surprised because, like, the, min the minister came to read with us, and it's also a great pleasure having him. I was actually thinking we're, going, we're, we're the one that will, that will be doing the reading, why we just be listening, but I was surprised when I saw the teacher gave him the book to read with us, so it's actually a pleasure. For us reading with the minister, and I want to thank the school authority for giving us this great opportunity. I was really happy because you hardly see someone of a high caliber like that to come to even a government school to spend his time with students, and I was very impressed. It will inspire a lot of them that somebody who was already a governor, who was a speaker, and presently a minister of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, is coming down to read with children. They will be wondering, somebody who is already there, why should they read? But you know that it's a common saying that readers are leaders. So it should go a long way to encourage the students and inspire them. Available statistics from the National Commission for Mass Literacy, Adult and Non-Formal Education, 
shows that 38% of Nigerians are non-literate. It also reveals that 4 in 10 primary school children cannot read for comprehension. Regrettably, this forms the basis for the World Culture Score Index rating, which rates Nigeria as one of the countries in the world with the lowest reading culture. It is hoped that gestures like this will motivate reading and comprehension among Nigeria's young generation. From Abuja, Amadine Uyi, New Central Television. Thank you, Amadine. Always lovely to see young people enjoy themselves. Now, staying in the country, the Minister of Information and Culture, Lai Mohammed, has urged citizens to focus on the role of culture to create a veritable platform for dialogue, which will improve human relations and engender societal development. The minister, represented by Ifoma Ayawu Taku, the permanent secretary in the ministry, made this call at the World Day for Cultural Diversity for Dialogue and Development with the team Cultural Diversity in the COVID-19 Era in Abuja. By its own distinct culture, we talk in culture, we talk of language, we talk of cuisine, foods, we talk of religion, we talk of fashion and clothing, we talk of architectural designs, we talk of music, and so on and so forth. Culture is a people's way of life, and it reflects in every aspect of society. Nigeria is home to multi-ethnic groups with diverse cultures, and the country's rich and unique cultural heritage is an invaluable asset that has continued to serve as a springboard to portray our nation's image to the rest of the world. Despite our cultural diversity, we have continually forged a path to a stronger, unified, and indivisible nation. As we are all aware, the world is currently being confronted by a common enemy, the COVID-19 pandemic. The pandemic has shaken the whole world, living in its wake, death, debilitation, loss of jobs, economic decline of nations, and even forced adjustment to a new world order, otherwise called the new normal. Vice President of Liberia, Joel Taylor, has tasked ECOWAS parliamentarians to focus on harnessing the potentials of youths within the sub-region. Taylor was speaking at the first ordinary session of the ECOWAS parliament, holding in Abuja, Nigeria's federal capital, says that the current youth demography can help the sub-region achieve its growth and development aspirations if properly utilized. She, however, warned that if ignored, the large number of youths left unemployed and discontented can trigger a serious crisis, causing severe instability in the region. It's no longer just statistics, but a glaring reality that more than 60% of Africa's population comprises of young people. In the next few years, the youth of Africa will form the largest population in the world and on our continent. Therefore, our ability to harness the fullest potential of this democratic dividends can engender an expansion of the growth and development possibilities on our continent. But if not prudently addressed, could trigger instability and crisis as what we have not yet ever seen. I believe that your task as the ECOWAS parliament is not a simple one, but I am confident that each of you possess the capabilities to accomplish the goals you have set for our regional joining together. This first ordinary session for the year 2021 is also projected to help us chart ways forward in the months ahead, particularly in engendering cohesion, in eliminating terrorism, all forms of extremism, and the better implementation of trade agreements and protocols. Added to these are the need to focus on irregular migration, often leading to needless sorrows, pains, and debts, the fight against diseases, drought, and the requirement to entrench transparency and accountability in our governance systems. It is a responsibility that we bear, and we have to do our best, God's willing. 
Looking at the situation in Mali, the Ghanaian president, Nanak Fodou, has initiated the convergence of the immediate extraordinary summit of the authority of ECOWAS heads of state and governments for a decisive action over the recent military coup in Mali. Akufuado, who is the chair of the authority, condemned the Mali coup at the opening of the 2021 first extraordinary session of the ECOWAS parliament in Abuja. This is the second time in nine months that Colonel Asimi Goita seized power in Mali, detaining interim president Bando and prime minister Mokta One. He said we should call an immediate extraordinary emergency summit of the authority which was responsible for ironing out the transitional arrangements to decide on the way forward for ECOWAS and Mali. The community will be kept fully apprised of developments on this issue. I cannot make this speech without referring to the unfortunate developments in one of our member states, that of Mali, in which ECOWAS has invested so much of its political and material capital. As current chairman of the authority, I authorized an ECOWAS delegation comprising the high-level mediator of the Malian crisis, the former president of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, His Excellency Goodluck Jonathan, the chair of the ECOWAS, the Council of ECOWAS Ministers, the Ghana's Foreign Minister, the Honorable Shelley Ayakobuche, and the president of the ECOWAS Commission, His Excellency John Claude Brew, to go immediately to Bamako to assess the situation and report back to me. We head now to the east of the continent. The United Nations humanitarian coordinator in Ethiopia, Catherine Soze, has spoken against the conduct of the Ethiopian military in Tigray, especially during the unrest that plagued the region. Speaking to reporters on the issue, UN spokesperson Stefan Dujaric called for an end to arbitrary arrest and the need for human rights to be respected. He also shed light on the humanitarian situation in Tigray, stressing the need to tackle food shortage and depreciating health services in the region. Coordinator there, Catherine Sozi, has condemned the arbitrary arrests, beatings, uh, and, and other forms of ill treatment by soldiers of more than 200 people during the military raids of internal displacement settings in the Tigray region during the night of May 24th. According to our colleagues, the affected uh, Tisei and Adi Wufinto sites in Shearer Town are hosting a combined of 12,000 displaced people. Ms. Swozi called for the immediate release of all those who have been arbitrarily arrested. She also said that serious violations of international humanitarian and human rights law must be promptly investigated and the perpetrators brought to justice. We, along with our partners, are ready to engage with military commanders to ensure protection of civilians. Coming up, African women and girls observe Menstrual Hygiene Day. We'll bring you details of this and more after the break. Stay with us. Good to know you're still with us. Now, today is Menstrual Hygiene Day. May 28 was chosen to observe the day because on an average, the menstrual cycle for most women is 28 days and the menstruation period for most is five days. Hence, the 28th of May, which is the fifth month. Menstrual hygiene and health for millions of women and girls have been suffering since the outbreak of the COVID-19 pandemic and successive lockdowns. Lack of resources and poverty are impacting the ability of people to manage their menstruation and health. The United Nations in a tweet on Friday says menstrual health is a human right, yet menstruation can result in discrimination, stigma and exclusion against women and girls. This year's team is action and investment in menstrual hygiene and health. Now, joining us to discuss this is Dr. Bernard Fatoye. He is a medical practitioner. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, the Thank news. you. Now, what is the significance of this day, really? All right. Um, like you rightly said, um, this is something that affects um, women worldwide, and it should be a, a human right. And so we'll get to that point where menstruation 
um, the dignity becomes a human right that is preserved, then we have a long way to go. Um, like you said, this is something that happens every five days in every woman or reproductive age. And um, when you consider that that's for 25 years, and we're talking about average seven years of a woman's life. And this seven years, um, when it's not, when the right um, support is not there, you, it has a lot of impact on the woman. That's, and of course, more important, the girl child could affect, affect education, to affect work. And at the end of the world, we see them, uh, inequal opportunities just because of gender inequality. Well, what, so what's quite your... significant. Okay, go ahead, please. So like I said, quite significant. Um, um, it's um, something that has been um, gathering, uh, gathering a lot of attention over the years. That, where that's actually had, where like, I was where going. Yeah, that was okay. actually where I was going, you know, the attention. How aware are people, uh, especially males, of the importance of acknowledging uh, the menstrual um, hygiene for women? Uh, well, I think, like I said, over the years, there's more attention towards this. Uh, where we are at the moment is not where we were 10 years ago. Um, the attention concerning menstrual health, uh, and I'm sure many women and girls can relate to this, have always been focused on the girl child and probably not as comprehensive as it should be. So when a girl begins to say a period, talking about an African set setting now, that's when you begin a, a mother or whoever is in that rule begins to tell um, the person this is this and this is that. Like I said, usually not as comprehensive as, as, it, as it used to be. And again, it was always focused on the burden was on that, on the girl child. But more and more, because this is something that we realize that it should be treated as human rights. Um, education around it has always been focused on everybody. Everybody needs to be aware. The um, boys needs to be aware. Men needs to be, we need to be aware of what, what essentially menstruation is and what essentially menstrual cycle is, understanding that it's a physiological activity that is totally normal and that women need our support for. All right, and let's talk about uh, period poverty. That's a term that has gained some, you know, popularity in recent um, uh, times. What's your thinking as to where we are as Africans as to eradicate this menstrual poverty? So uh, let's break it down so that everybody gets to understand what you mean by menstrual poverty or period poverty. Period poverty. Um, so basically, we're talking about the economic vulnerability um, that um, women face due to the financial burden um, from attaining a normal menstrual healthy life, so to say. So broken down, basically, it means the extra expenses women will have to incur just because uh, there is a um, physiological activity, that's a normal activity that will happen every month. And this is important, especially in developing countries, especially, most important, especially in areas that are affected by crisis and all that. Uh, you can, uh, I'm sure a lot of women can relate to how, how much um, disturbance of normal activities that shouldn't happen anyway, it would happen even in a normal life, not now talk of what will happen in a place like Northeast where there's so much, um, um, so much happening. You understand what I mean? Yeah. So um, it's something that uh, is beginning to, like I said, get gamer and attention. Uh, we've seen quite a number of countries um, make laws and policies that are more friendly and, uh, and um, pushing the cost of women. Um, so, um, but looking at Africa now, because I know you're going to ask that question, I'm probably <laughs> Nigeria. Let me yeah. just go straight to it. So looking at Africa, uh, well, we're far, we're really far, uh, just as in many other indices that we might want to look at, but we have quite a number of countries doing something about it actively at the national level. I know there's, um, Kenya is doing something, Zimbabwe has done something, uh, Mauritania has done something, Tanzania, um, mostly in the area of just, uh, tax. Uh, um, exemptions from some of these products, so that at the end of the day, we don't see an issue. We don't see uh, a case of um, 
sanity products rising the same way rising. Um, in the I'm afraid I will have to interject here in the interest of time. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Bernard Fatoye, for speaking to us. Thank you for having me. Thank you very much. Most welcome. Still ahead. United States President proposes $6 trillion 2022 budget. More on this when we return. The United States President, Joe Biden, has released his 2022 budget proposal, a $6 trillion plan that would add more than $1 trillion annually to the federal deficit. The sweeping plan, which tops Donald Trump's $4.8 trillion proposal last year, promises infrastructure upgrades and an expanded social safety net. The proposal will be given to Congress and needs approval to be implemented. If passed, it will bring the U.S. to spending levels not seen since World War II. In the meantime, Republicans in the U.S. Senate have blocked a bill to establish a bipartisan commission to investigate the Capitol Hill riot. Last week, the measure passed the U.S. House of Representatives. Republicans say the riot is already being investigated by congressional panels. Democrats argue that forming a commission similar to the one created after 9-11 would prevent any repeat of a similar invasion on the Capitol. Trump supporters stomped Congress on January 6 in a failed bid to overturn the certification of Joe Biden's victory in November's election. Although 54 senators, including six Republicans, voted in favor of creating the commission, the bill failed. It needed 60 votes due to a rule called the Philly Buster, where 60 of the 100 senators must vote in favor of a bill for it to pass. Tolu Lokwe Adele Rubalogu is here with Business News. Welcome to Business on NC Continental Prime. My name is Tolu Lokwe Adila Rubalogun. The Central Bank of Kenya has maintained the benchmark rate at 7% for the eighth consecutive time during the latest Monetary Policy Committee meeting. The committee said that leading economic indicators show strong economic recovery in the first quarter of this year. The inflation rate stood at 5.8% in April, within the bank's target range of 25 to 7.5%. Private sector activity remained resilient with credit to the sector at 6.8% in the 12 months through April 2021. A new report from PwC Nigeria has highlighted the need for the petroleum industry bill to provide a clear plan for a gradual transition to renewable energy in the country. The report pointed out the pivotal role of the Nigerian National Petroleum Corporation in accelerating the transition to renewable energy, and this role cannot be overemphasized. The International Energy Agency, in its Pathway to Net Zero Emissions by 2050 report, called for an end to upstream oil and gas investment. A number of refineries in Africa have been offline, either following maintenance, as is the case in Zambia, or due to a lack of crude supply, as with Ghana's Tema refinery. Ghana's sole oil refinery stopped operations in recent weeks due to a lack of crude supply. However, the current government, through its ministries of energy and finance, has supported the Tema oil refinery to replace its burnt furnace. This will put the refinery on the road to processing more crude oil for both the local and international market. On Business Edge, I spoke to Inamdi Wisnu, the co-managing partner, commercial partners about the refinery. Well, uh, I would say that down to two things. One would be a bit of mismanagement that we see across uh, most African countries. And the second would have to do a lot with politics. A lot of people tend to, a lot of governments tend to look for ways to appease their people and appease the populace uh, and electorate. And what they do is they more or less end up, you know, giving out contracts, uh, running favors and all sorts of things. 
and I've been very professional. Um, some people look at it as you know, their rights. So if you look at Nigeria, for instance, and constrain the fact that we still refuse to remove fully remove false subsidy. Why? Because it's being used as a means to appease the people, which definitely means that the petroleum sector will be running at uh, NMPs will be running working optimally. So basically, it's a trend that you see across a lot of African countries. Mm. And before we wrap things up, let's turn the spotlight on stories of economic recovery coming from across the continent. This is The Rebound. The International Monetary Fund staff have agreed to provide $1.5 billion to the Democratic Republic of Congo over the next three years likely securing the country's first formal loan program with the lender since 2012. The agreement will mark the end of two years of negotiations between the DR Congo and the IMF. The IMF financing comes with conditions including reforms of the central bank and value-added tax system and more transparency in the mining industry. Congo is Africa's largest producer of copper and the world's biggest source of cobalt. The IMF halted its last loan program with Congo at the end of 2012 amid concerns over corruption in the industry after the government declined to publish a contract for a copper deal involving Joseph Kabila's family. However, the lender has also predicted that Congo's economy is set to grow 4.9% in 2021 as the country emerges from the pandemic and benefits from the high copper and cobalt prices. Forbes Middle East reported that Morocco is expected to emerge as the fifth strongest African economy in 2021 in a recent piece on best performing economies on the continent. Forbes used the most recent gross domestic product data that the International Monetary Fund made public to assess the economic outlook for Africa in 2021. With a projected GDP of $124 billion, Morocco will be Africa's fifth biggest economy this year. Nigeria, Egypt, South Africa and Algeria also made an appearance on the list. And that's it on business on NC Continental Prime. My name is Solulokwe Adila Rebalogun. There's more news coming your way. Thank you, Tolu. Let's now join Sheo Bankale for the latest trends. Ladies and gentlemen, the weekend is upon us. Okay, but just before we activate CGIF, first let me bring you beats of social media trends today on NC Trends. Welcome, I am Sheo Bankale. Now, fans worldwide are excited and set to catch the action on Saturday between Man City and Chelsea football clubs at the Champions League finals. In Africa particularly, we are rooting for players of African descent, that is Man City's Riyad Mahrez from Algeria, Chelsea's N'Golo Kante from Mali and Edward Mendy from Senegal. Now, let's see what people are saying about the Champions League finals online. Reality TV star Rico Suave put out this tweet that reads, I will be supporting Chelsea at the hashtag Champions League final. The gang up against them is just too much. I can relate. At ID Ike says, My head tells me Man City and my heart says Chelsea. May the better team win. Amen. Hashtag Champions League final. Finally, Kenneth put out this tweet that reads, It's going to be a massive game against Man City, but Chelsea is winning this trophy. Mm, it's a lot of guts. It's an end to one correct score. Oh, wow. <laughs> All right, so let us know what you think about who has the biggest influence on the game. What are your scoreline predictions? Tweet at New Central TV with the hashtags Champions League Final and NC Trends to predict the scorelines. Moving away from that, some sad reports coming from Bainway State on the death of 36 people who were killed on Thursday in the north central state of Nigeria. The genocide reportedly perpetrated by headsmen has got the entire social media space abuzz with the hashtag Benue under attack. Let's check some reactions online. Afroco Doctor says, We can't fold our hands and watch anymore. Hashtag Benue under attack. People are being killed in their homes and lands 
and the government is watching. This is a ticking time bomb. Protect all Nigerian citizens. Kato Takab says, as the killings keep rising and nothing substantial is being done, we all in Benue State and the entire Middle Belt may end up losing our lives, our identity and our land if we fail to rise up now. This is a genocide and must be referred to as such. Hashtag Benue under attack. Kate Enshaw put out this tweet that reads, as much as I'm trying to focus on other things, the images of bodies laying on the floor in huge numbers has dampened my spirit somewhat. Why does life mean nothing in Nigeria? Big question to our rulers. Too much bloodshed, too much God. Hashtag Benway under attack. That, now that's a really sad one there. And we hope for a quick return to sanity in Benway, in Nigeria, and in Africa at large. Now, for those who do not know, today is World Menstrual Hygiene Day. Observed on May 28th every year, the goal is to change the social stigma associated with menstruation. And the theme for this year is action and investment in menstrual hygiene and health. Now we'll look at some comments from African Sweeps on the hashtag MHDay2021. John Ungungo says, it's hashtag menstrual hygiene day. Let us end the stigma surrounding menstrual periods and invest on creating awareness on the importance of both menstrual hygiene and menstrual health for our women and girls around the world. Hashtag menstrual hygiene day 2021. Okay, this tweet from Esther reads, often women and girls find it difficult to talk about menstruation due to shame or cultural norms. I mean, it is time to break the silence, promote increased awareness and access to menstrual health management services. Hashtag menstrual hygiene day. Finally on that, United Nations put out the tweet that reads, periods are just as natural as breathing. Retweet. <laughs> Without periods, no one would be here. And that's on period. <laughs> okay, so this is where we wrap things up on this segment. Have a fabulous weekend. I'll see you on Monday. Not really nice trends there, Cheryl, are they? But thank you very much for bringing it to us. Now on to sports. And for it, we have Doka and Joko. Doka, good evening. And today. What's happening with sports? Oh, well, uh, very well. The first story takes us to Egypt and Aston Villa, where the former Egypt captain Ahmed El Mohamedi has confirmed his Aston Villa exit following the expiry of his contract. El Mohamedi joined the club in 2017 to reunite with his former Hull City coach, Steve Bruce, and he played a key role in their promotion to the Premier League in the 2018-2019 season. The right back also featured in the League Cup final against Manchester City in 2020. And in total, he has made 129 appearances for Aston Villa in all competitions with four goals to his name. El Mohamedi played 14 matches in the just-concluded Premier League campaign as the Smith side finished 11th on the league table. It is unsure if the 33-year-old will continue his career in England following his departure from the Villa Park. And the player was the, the captain of the Egypt national team until April 2021 when it was succeeded by Liverpool talisman Mohamed Salah. Moving over to South Africa now, Kaiser Chiefs have fired coach uh, Gavin Hunt with two matches left in their 2020-2021 Premiership season. Now, Chiefs made the announcement on their official Twitter page this evening. In the interim, assistant coaches Arthur Zwani and Dylan Shepard will take charge of the senior team. And Chiefs had, they had hoped four-time league winner Hunt arriving in September last year to replace Ernst Middendorf after Amakosi were pipped to the Premiership on the final day of the 2019-2020 season would bring trophies to the club. Instead, 2020-2021 will be the Soweto Giants' sixth campaign without silverware when the previous longest was a season. The Amakosi have had a miserable season domestically and their 11th place in the Premiership and on the back of an appalling run of two wins in their last 16 matches are facing marching or ending lower than their worst two finishes of ninth position. Moving over to Scotland, former Bournemouth manager Eddie Howe has turned down the opportunity to be Celtic's new team boss. The Scottish, Scottish Giants had hoped for the three-year-old would sign a contract in the next few days after he became their preferred candidate. It is not clear why he decided against the move, but it is understood the makeup of his backroom staff could have played a part. And Celtic hoped to appoint a successor to Neil Lennon in the coming days. Celtic, who had won four consecutive domestic trebles, ended the current campaign without a trophy for the first time since 2010. Lastly, former U.S. President Barack Obama has praised England forward Marcus Rashford 
for his work tackling child food poverty. And the two, two, the two of them discussed by video call how young people can make an impact on society. Now, last year, Rashford led a campaign to end child food poverty and successfully lobbied the British government to continue providing free school meals during the holidays. The 23 year old was awarded an MBE for services to vulnerable children during the COVID 19 pandemic. Marcus, I think, is way ahead of where I was at 23. I was still trying to figure it out. <laughs> for me, being in, in sports, I just knew that my life could change very, very quickly. And if I wasn't like mature enough or you know, at a certain level in, in my own head, then it makes stuff like fame and, and bits like that even more difficult to, to cope with. Through books, you can, you can grow yourself in whichever way you want, rather than somebody keep telling me to do this and do that. Uh, books allowed me to just do it my own way. Entire worlds are possible in books. You can grow and, 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 and discover and make connections that you might not otherwise have made just by the simple act of picking up and opening a book. When you look at the history of big social movements and big social change, it's usually young people who initiate this. If you give someone a, a helping hand at a young age, they'll go on to do things that, you know, even they didn't think or believe that was achievable to accomplish. Good one for Marcus Rashford. And of course, I'm getting that accolade from uh, the former president of the United States of America, Barack Obama. And that's will draw a wrap on sports updates. Head over to Felicity for the rest of the news. Thank you very much, Udoka. Good conversation with uh, Obama and Rashford there. Moving on now, we have Sam Dandy. He joins us for the latest in entertainment. Thank you very much. And now to entertainment news. When you search the name DJ Switch, you will get two results. One, a professional Nigerian disc jockey who remained a strong voice at the Enters protest in Nigeria. And the other, Erika Tando, the youngest person to win Ghana's annual DJ awards in 2018. But here's why DJ Switch Ghana is in the news. Award-winning Ghanaian disc jockey DJ Switch has paid a courtesy call on Vice President Dr. Mahmoudou Baumia. She was at the Jubilee House, the seat of government in Accra, on Wednesday, May 26th. It is believed that the 13-year-old entertainer accompanied ambassadors of the International Youth Empowerment Summit to discuss, among other things, the 2021 summit and matters relating to the youths. Erika Tando, popularly known as DJ Switch Ghana, rose to fame after winning the TV3 Talented Kids competition in 2018 at age 11. After being announced winner, the young star repeatedly mentioned her intentions to use some of the monies she gets from playing at events and her DJ Switch Foundation to support the less privileged in society. In October 2019, she made a donation of 50 desks, four sets of tables and chairs to the students and teachers of AME Zion Junior High School at Brafoya in Cape Coast, Ghana. DJ Switch, who sings, raps, dances, acts, delivers poems and motivational speeches, has in a few years gained wider international recognition. She was later featured in Rock Nation's Black History Month, an entertainment company owned by American rapper Jay-Z. That's not all. In 2019, she opened the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation Goalkeepers event in New York and has also performed at the World Bank Symposium in Washington. In 2019, the young Dix jockey released her first single, Success, along with a music video which now has over 700,000 views on YouTube. Yeah, yeah. Today, the 13-year-old has four DJ of the Year awards in 2018, 2019, and 2020 in the category of Best Discovery, Best Female DJ, and Young DJ of the Year. She's also been acknowledged as one of the 50 most influential women who are change makers by Incel Magazine and of 74 exemplary Ghanaians who inspire the country. Most recently, she was awarded Best Young Entertainer of the Year in the 2021 edition of the International Reggae and World Music Awards. It's certainly impressive to see the milestones this youngster has been able to achieve. And there's no telling how far she'll go. Say DJ Switch. Say DJ Switch. On the other hand, Obianu Ju Catherine Ude, professionally known as DJ Switch Nigeria, is a DJ musician who emerged as a winner of the Glow X Factor in 2013 at the age of 29. She first earned attention with her group, The Pulse, emerged as the winner of the 2009 edition of the Relative Music competition Star Quest. They further went on to release a hit song titled Sauté, which featured American rapper in the remix. Well, now that you know the difference between DJ Switch Ghana and DJ Switch Nigeria, they're two different but yet strong and influential women. 
And that's our entertainment news. I am Sam Dandy. It's now time to check out what to expect from the weather across the continent. That's all on the news at this hour. But before we go, let's take another look at some of our major stories. Germany has officially recognized colonial era Namibia genocide. United Nations has criticized the conduct of Ethiopian military in Tigray. And finally, we told you that Africa's COVID-19 case load nears 4.8 million. To follow us on social media, we are Art News Central TV. You can download our mobile app on App Store and Play Store. Watch us live on Star Times Channel 274 as well as our TV Channel 23. You also have us live on YouTube. As always, thank you very much for your kind attention. I'm Felicity. See you.